Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our session. Although it's you know Friday evening, last day of the conference, still quite some people in the room. And then I hope today we will have like a good experience together during our presentation. So during, uh, today, during our presentation, we just want to, to show you guys, for example, the way Densplice Sirona is taking in managing thousands of edge devices, which are actually deployed on on-premise devices. So my name is Bogdan Mitra. I'm architect on Densplice Sirona, and then actually that's the first time I'm presenting in a KubeCon. So uh, I hope it will be like a nice experience for me, and then you guys, I hope you get quite a lot from our presentation. So today I will be on the stage with Kevin. So Kevin, you can take the floor. Good day, everyone. My name is Kevin Rewijk. I'm a principal architect for Spectro Cloud. And I've been working together with Bogdan in the last 10 months to uh, finalize this solution. And we would like to walk you through it. So um, as we are going to be talking about um, taking dentistry into the 21st century, I want to start with a genuine uh, trigger warning because um, I don't know how this is for you guys, but um, the next image that we're going to show might trigger something that you've had in your childhood, and um, it, it was for me. And it's um, if you if you can't handle this sort of stuff, close your eyes, and I'll tell you when the image is gone. So, um, if you ever get dental impressions for braces, then this is the stuff you have to bite into. And if you're 35 or over, then you can probably still imagine what this, how horrible this stuff is. I had braces when I was 16, and for me this stuff was purple, not blue, but I can still, I can still taste how this stuff smells. And I know it, maybe you can still taste how this stuff smells. Um, Bogdan, please tell me that there is a, a better way today to do this. Yes, actually, Kevin, there is definitely a better way. So then I will just share it with you, for example. So as you can see here, you know, the title is very, you know, fancy. And then I will just try to, to put some words and show, for example, how actually the new technology help us to improve both patient and doctor experience. So as you can see here, it's actually using the latest technologies. It's pretty straightforward. And then the doctor can seamlessly use like an intraoral scanner to scan the, the mouth of the patient and then create a 3D model after, uh, out of it. So of course, this one will help quite a lot. For example, the user experience, I mean, the patient experience plus will support also the, the doctor to, to get like a better uh, understanding of the, of the 3D model, right? So then our research kind of say that mm, a, almost 80% of the patients were actually way more happy with this approach. So then I think, uh, Kevin, you might be also one of this guy here. I would have loved if this existed <laughs> when I had to do this. OK, now really on the, on the, on the short notice how actually this works. So we, the, the patient is just uh, joining the, the dentist for, for a treatment. You know, he will just take a, a seat. And then uh, the doctor using the intraoral scanner will uh, do like a scanning of the, of the month. And then all the data will be streamed to our edge device, which is hidden somewhere in the office. And then uh, there we will actually process the information using uh, our, uh, service, our rendering services, which are backed by GPU power. And then as soon as the, the model is created, you know, this one will be just shown on the display to the doctor. So then he can you know, take further, further uh, actions, you know, checking if everything is fine, make some adjustments, and then at the end, you know, just push uh, the model to the cloud to actually either send it, for example, to some labs for, for, for being ordered or, you know, open some other uh, flows on, on our side. So you can imagine that this is quite a big difference from how things used to be, right? So on the left hand side, that was what it was for me. It wasn't great for the patient. I had to, like, prevent myself from hurling over the doctor. It wasn't great for dentists, a lot of manual work and uh, sometimes mopping the floor, but there was like no IT involved. It, maybe you had to do it twice if you were unlucky, but that was about it. On the right hand side, like I would have been a much happier patient. The doctor is much happier because their patients feel they've get an, uh, have gotten a much better service. 
But you can imagine that the DevOps team is like, how the hell are we going to put a Kubernetes device at the edge where there's no one that can help and I have no remote access to it? How do I do that? So that's what we're here to talk about. Um, because it's not about just running Kubernetes. Because of course, if you're building a new applica application, you're building it on top of Kubernetes. But if you're shipping that to a remote dentist office, then now you're talking about edge Kubernetes. And there's a lot below the waterline of the kind of issues that you run into with, as I said, no local skills. The doctor can turn it on and turn it off. That's about all that they can do. There is, how do you do remote maintenance? How do you work on networks that you don't control? What happens when the doctor goes on vacation and they turn off the thing for six weeks, right? There's a bunch of problems here. So how do we, how do we tackle those? Okay, so then during this journey, I mean, as Kevin mentioned, initially it all was, it's running for almost uh, one year for us. So then we had really a lot of challenges regarding managing uh, edge devices on scales. So here we are grouping on three big parts, which I think are very important uh, to be considered whenever you guys want to, to manage devices on on-premise devices, the, uh, on on-premise environments. So the first one is actually really regarding the onboarding. How actually how we are sending the edge device to the uh, to the to the doctors because m most of the time you know the doctors they are good in what they are doing but actually they don't have much uh, technical expertise. So it's really hard for example for them you know to we cannot ask them actually to say yeah you need to connect to the device and <laughs> they run some uh, uh, Linux commands. The other big challenge for us is that uh, the edge device uh, can run in some uncontrolled networks, which obviously can be different from customer to customers, right? But then we still have to, to manage this one on a, in order to be able to, to deploy on scales. And nevertheless, we want to, to give like a very good experience to, to our customers, right? So then the whole idea for us is just to have like a plug and play uh, device which actually is, share, is shipped by some logistics company and then the doctor get it, you know, they just turn it on and then every, everything should automatically or magically happen, you know, within updating the services, getting security updates and so on. The, the next big challenge is regarding to security. And then this one, I mean, we really have to take it high into consideration because we are running under some high, highly regulated environments. So we need to definitely consider, for example, which sensitive data is available on the edge device and then how can we protect it. And nevertheless, we in a fast running environment of you know, software world, you know, things are changing quite, quite fast, new vulnerabilities uh, are available, so then we, we should be able to quickly react on those and then provide you know, patches to, to the services which are running on premise. And nevertheless, the maintenance uh, was another challenge which gave us some kind of a headaches, right? So then the main problem here is that there is no physical access to, to this edge device, right? So the device is just running somewhere in a field and then we actually, in case of issues, have to be able to jump in and then figure out, for example, what the problem is and then, yeah, more important, we need to fix those issues. And then, of course, we, we have some software drifts and you know, and ages uh, for we need to provide you know operating system updates uh, we need to provide co kubernetes updates and then of course we also want to update over there our services in case we need to patch or to to deploy some some new versions and last but not least we definitely need to have like a proper fleet uh, monitoring solution right i mean we deploy on the, on the field and we don't want actually the dentist or the clients to figure out that there is an issue with the edge device, so we want to be one step ahead of them and then discover this on, on our own. So now by uh, having all these challenges, it was actually pretty challenging, for example, to find like a, like a solution and now in the next slides I will uh, try to explain you based on some based on these challenges how actually we came up with uh, our requirements for, for our platform So by as I said before, you know by going from the onboarding challenges We actually came up with some some requirements as I said uh, one of the requirements from our business uh, Guides were, were actually to have like really like a plug-and-play solution You know you just plug it into the network and then itself it gets self-updated uh, 
without uh, the doctor being necessary to do anything. So this one will also remove the need of having like a service technician uh, on the field, which, I mean, if you're just multiplying with the number of practices we are managing, so then it will be like quite some, some money for the company. And the other uh, requirement which actually came from the onboarding is uh, we need to be very careful on how actually we can run Kubernetes clusters on different networks. On some networks, you know, there is a DHCP, so then uh, we don't, uh, we, we are, there, there is the DHCP enabled, so for example, in some other uh, cluster uh, praxis, they actually need, for example, to set up some proxies in order to get connected to the internet. So. Uh, no, we have to take care of all this because, as I said, you know, uh, the environment from customer to customer might be, might be different. Now discussing about the security, so I will say here that, you know, based on this one, we actually came up with some clear uh, requirements on our side, so we will definitely need to understand the flow of the, of the data running on the edge device to see where actually some sensitive information is used in order to be able to protect it. So based on, on these uh, challenges, we came up with, we need to have like full disk encryption uh, enabled on the, on the, for, for the edge device because we are also storing some uh, patient raw data on the device for, for some amount of time. Uh, secure boot is also very important uh, to be considered because I mean, as I said, we have like a manufacturer which is delivering edge devices, so nothing is actually on our hands. So from the moment the edge device is built until the moment the edge device reach the, the dentist, you know, a lot of things can, can happen. So then we have to make sure that nobody tamper and install some malicious software, and then we should be able to also detect this one. And this one is done through the, through the, yeah, through the secure boot. And then, of course, uh, we want to keep, uh, this, uh, we, we want to, to be on the latest version regarding the patches and security updates, so then we need to be able to update over there the Ubuntu operating system we are actually using. So now coming from the, uh, from the maintenance uh, challenges, we uh, actually came up also with some, some uh, requirements. So our solutions should, should be resilient against failures. I mean, failures will always happen. You know, uh, yeah, I'm working actually for almost 18 years in the field and then I, I never saw like a perfect uh, software. So at some point, uh, it will happen. And then we definitely need to have like a central solution where actually we can monitor all our devices, right? So then uh, it's nothing more annoying for an operation teams and yeah, you might know guys, then you know, tell you, you know guys, you need to open this application to see this and then you need to open another application to, to monitor some other things. So it's really important to have one single pane of glass for, for everything related to the edge devices. So now the, the question, how, actually, how did we, pick up the right uh, platform, you know, to help us managing our edge devices. So here I, I will say that I spent, you know, a lot of nights maybe drinking tons of uh, coffees, you know, trying to, to doing different pox with different uh, providers. So I will say that from a functionality, functionality point of view, they are actually very similar, but then a lot of companies, they still have, I mean, a lot of solutions, they still, they still have this, uh, data center management uh, uh, mindset. When, whenever we, I mean, in, in one company, if you manage like a cluster, uh, like a data center, you might have, I don't know, a few hundreds clusters, right? But then with edge device, it's a completely different uh, game because we are talking here about uh, thousands of, of devices. I mean, you can imagine how many practices is, are, and then on, on each of them, we will have to deploy an edge device. So that's how actually we end up uh, selecting edge, uh, selecting Palette as a platform for us to, to, to manage, and one of the main reasons was actually the, the flexibility they offered to us to be able to integrate with different other applications, which I will just talk a bit later. So, Kevin. Now. Yeah, so um, if we take a small tour around what Palette Edge does, um, it is based on um, Kairos, which is an open source uh, meta distribution. If you go to kairos.io, you'll see there's an open source project that we maintain, that we've built, um, that took the um, starting components of Elemental, originally developed by Rancher, and we basically um, completed all of that work and took it to the next level. Um, Elemental is no longer maintained by Rancher themselves. 
what we're able to do with this is set up um, any OS that you want. So we'll, we uh, it supports uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, uh, Alpine, RHEL. Uh, you can start with any OS that you want. Uh, makes an immutable image of it that can be flashed onto a real device. So it makes an ISO, you uh, stick it in the device and it uh, uh, puts the software on there. Makes an A and a B partition. Uh, since it is immutable, it works on a container image. So we download a container image, we have two copies of it on it on the box, and we can, uh, we can boot into one or the other. So when we do upgrades, um, we automatically up upgrade the second image, try to boot in it if that works, it, uh, we upgrade the first one. If it doesn't, we roll back. So this gives you a really flexible platform, and then we've added some um, commercial components to it. Um, one overlay networking support. So these devices, whether it's one or multiple, they will find each other at a location, and then they will uh, ad hoc build a VXLAN network um, uh, with each other, so that um, all of the Kubernetes nodes that run on top of them can run inside of the VXLAN network on static IP addresses that will never change, while the real network underneath can be anything and can change. So Bogdan was actually able to deploy clusters, bring them home, um, and they would work uh, there as well, which is really relevant because they want to be able to pre-stage a cluster, make sure it's all working, and then ship it to a customer, so it goes to a completely different network which means that you need something like this to be able to do so. This is really powerful. The next thing that we did is we added trusted boot and full disk encryption capabilities. So this is full secure boot, boot measurements and full disk encryption that allows the system to be completely tamper-proof um, from the get-go. And, and we take care of all of the work of like getting the keys imported into secure boot um, and uh, even making it possible that, for example, you can use signed uh, NVIDIA drivers so that uh, your GPU can still operate while the system is in secure boot mode. So, and then on top of that, um, all of this is remotely managed. We have a device management agent and a cluster management agent running in here. The device management agent will allow us to do full upgrades so we can be, uh, pull in another image for a different OS or a different Kubernetes version so that you can do build-to-build uh, uh, -build upgrades. And then the cluster management agent will allow you to build a cluster and update all of the components uh, within there. And then this all uh, uh, reports into our SaaS platform. In the case of uh, Densely, they get a dedicated SaaS platform that they are the only owner of to make sure that all the data is within their uh, jurisdiction. And if we go to the next slide, um, this SaaS platform um, gives, uh, provides a wealth of open source projects that you can use, both open source and commercial, um, to uh, finalize the solution. So if you want to use NGINX and uh, Metal LB or Argo CD or Flux or all of these things, you can just grab them from our, um, either our public uh, repository or, or our community, community repository. Um, and quickly build up a cluster profile, as you can see here, to build your clusters with and then maintain your clusters with that. All right, so let's take a look at how we then actually ship a device to a remote location and what happens when it gets there. So uh, let me uh, first talk about what we do out of the box and then what Densply did to take it to the next level. So as I said, um, our um, uh, builder will create an ISO that you stick into the device, it bootstraps, it flashes the uh, core OS to the disk with a registration agent, and then basically you can put it in a warehouse, you can stock it, and then at some point in time in the future it will be sent to the customer. And so when it gets to the customer, it, they can power it on, and then there are two options. Either you've pre-configured automatic registration, and it will just show up in Palette as, a as an edge host that is ready for provisioning, and you can deploy a cluster to it. Or you can do some sort of self-service registration, where it will show a QR code on the screen, assuming there is a screen connected. They can uh, scan that with a phone, they will get uh, redirected to a registration website, and then there they can register the device, after which a cluster profile can be attached to it, uh, by, via an admin, and then uh, the cluster builds and uh, fully deploys, and the, the user can use it. But um, uh, Densply wanted to go a couple steps further, further and make this fully hands-off, so let's take a look at what they've done. 
Yeah, so for, in our case, we actually wanted to customize a bit the, the baseline which was provided by Spectro team. So then, I mean, here on the edge manufacturer warehouse part, uh, on our side, we are just building like an ISO image. We have like a partner which is building edge devices for us based on our specifications. So they are just flashing the ISO on the edge devices and then at some point, you know, they will be shipped to, to, the, uh, to a warehouse. From there, actually, we go to the step uh, two when the edge device is uh, reaching the the on-premise side, right? So then here, uh, the Spectro Cloud provides, some, pro provides the possibility to auto-register the edge devices with their platform whenever they, turn it, they are turned on. But then actually, we don't want to, to have this approach. So then we just disable this functionality. And instead, we want to be in control and decide when uh, an edge device will be imported into, into the platform. So therefore, we have like a onboarding application, which is running on mobile phone. And then this one communicates with the edge devices via the Bluetooth, uh, via the Bluetooth protocol. So this one gives you quite some benefits, because if there is even something wrong with the edge device, uh, which, for example, cannot connect to the internet via this Bluetooth uh, application, we can also make some network adjustments if necessary. As soon as the edge device is onboarded in, in our platform, you know, we are just uh, whitelisting the, the connection to the pallet by creating, like, uh, I think it's called like an edge host on, on the pallet. And then as soon as this one is created, the edge device and, and the, the, the twin in the cloud, you know, they are just uh, a pairing, and then at this moment, based on our configuration in, in our palette, uh, all the, the profiles will start be uh, deployed to, to our edge device, meaning that all our applications are getting deployed. And then uh, roughly, you know, for, for our full stack, you know, of course, depends also on the, on the network quality of the, of the customer. But we need, for example, 30, uh, 40 minutes to fully install like an edge device on premise, and then to, to create Edge devices, we are also using Terraform modules, which are provided by the Spectre team. Yeah, so now, for example, I will just want to, to highlight, for example, some key strategies. We are actually thinking that are very important, for example, uh, whenever you guys are considering running edge devices on, on premise. The first one is, you know, related to data encryption. So based on your business, uh, it can be that, for example, you store some, uh, sec uh, some uh, sensitive information on the edge device. So then you, uh, you really need, for example, to take care or think uh, beforehand, you know, what actually do I need to do? So there are three uh, things which we are definitely recommended. Uh, encrypt data in transit, encrypt data on REST. And then nevertheless, you need to have like a solid approach for uh, encryption keys management. Because I mean, if keys are leaks or whatever, you know, you have to be able to, to rotate or you know, even to, to revoke. Uh, the, the next thing we think we should, it's very good actually to be followed is this zero trust uh, approach. And, and, then for, uh, and, and then in this case, you know, try to, because, I mean, the main problem is that nothing is on our environment, so then we cannot trust uh, anybody. So just go, for example, with least privileges access. So we even, we, on our side, we even remove, for example, uh, user password credentials from, from an edge device. So actually, uh, even if I want, by default, nobody will be able to connect uh, to the edge device because there are no credentials. And then nevertheless, uh, define some uh, policies which has to be enforced you know, here I'm talking mainly about the Kubernetes policies, you know, to, to make sure that, for example, an, an attacker or, or like a bad actor is not able to pull images, you know, from untrusted sources and then just uh, deploy on, on your Kubernetes cluster in case it's compromised. And then the third thing I think is actually crucial is uh, uh, intrusion detection. So I'm, as I said, I'm in, in the field for quite some time, and I don't think there is a perfect software which is 100% secure. And then I think you guys can, can also confirm this one, right? So it's just might be just a matter of time until uh, something bad will, will happen. And I think nobody wants to get like a spot in the, in the, in the newspapers, you know, that uh, there was like a security breach or data breach for, for your company, right? So then it's very important to have some measures on 
to detect, for example, if, if a breach actually occurs, right? So then it's really important to be able to react fast when, when something uh, like this happened. There were many companies when actually <laughs> somebody was just breaching uh, devices and then they were just stay there for, I don't know, months until, <laughs> you know, they detect it. So we definitely don't want this one. So then to react fast, you know, define a process to exactly know what you have to do when actually a breach happened, you know, rotate keys, and then in case of some keys are compromised, you know, we just have to have like a process to, to revoke the, the keys. Now we will talk also a bit of about the, I mean, our key findings regarding the maintenance of edge devices into the field. So, for, for example, from this perspective, as I said, you know, we want to, in the first place, we actually want to deploy uh, updates automatically. So automation is key. So there is no doubt that, you know, somebody will consider to do something manual because, I mean, on, on such amount of uh, devices, it actually, I mean, not impossible, but it will be really hard and uh, be, we have like a lot of headaches. So, I mean, talking about automation, service, and operating system updates, as I highlighted already in some of the previous slides. And nevertheless, guys, you don't need to reinvent uh, the, the wheels, you know? So, I mean, some of the wheels are already there. So just try to follow some well-known parad paradigms, like, you know, GitOps approach, which gives you the possibility to easily deploy uh, services on Kubernetes and also follow follow up some best practices which are related to Kubernetes deployment strategies, like, you know, rollout deployments. And then nevertheless, re relating to maintenance, the other important part is alert alerting and, and monitoring. We definitely need to, to automate alerts and then try to create, for example, some smart thresholds because, I mean, there is nothing more annoying than uh, some false positive on alerts because, I mean, if this one will happen several times, you know, people will just tend to <laughs> send it directly to the spam box. <laughs> And then, yeah, we need to find, the, obviously, first the, the issues and not our clients. And the next step will be to consider AI and LM, ML to actually improve this one by running some anomaly detection to be able to detect some deviation from your normal patterns. And then finally, let's take a look at monitoring. So you want to be able to have a broad view of your fleet out in the field. And as Bog then said, um, find out about issues earlier before your customers do, so that you can react and be aware before they actually make the phone call that there is some sort of issue. So at the bottom, you see an example of our geographic um, like uh, operations sh uh, screen that shows you where your customers are running with a coloring that shows the status. And then more information here on the side to give you an indication of whether those clusters are healthy or if there is a, a problem with it. Um, and you can even go further with that. Um, I know that Densely uses uh, tags a lot to um, not just do location data, but also customer data. And they can use this to automate um, like which specific configurations go to a customer. Um, and our, the, the tag-based system can also be used within Pallet to filter down uh, the, the views into like anything that matches particular tags. So as you get to thousands and thousands of devices, this becomes really critical to make sure that you can uh, zoom into a particular environment really quickly. Yes, and actually with tags, you can even, for example, deliver you know, updates based on uh, certain tags, which means that, for instance, you can just start deploying for some updates in a specific region and then afterwards moving towards the rest of the world. So here I just want to emphasize that, you know, the takeaway from here is just consider to have like a single pane of glass for, for monitoring because this will actually help a lot, guys. So yeah, now as we are approaching, you know, the, the final minutes of the, of the presentation, I will also share with you some of the lessons learned uh, we had during this uh, almost a year journey. So let's just dive, uh, for example, on, on those. So the very first one, learning, I mean, initially I thought that actually, yeah, it's not so difficult, you know, to, <laughs> to manage like an edge device. But then actually it's uh, way harder than uh, we, we saw initially, right? So then there are extra security challenge. You know, we, we, we go in unknown customer environment. And then uh, remote troubleshooting also give us some headaches. The, the other uh, big learning on our side is like selecting an edge management was also like a complex and uh, kind of a complicated process because I mean, there are some uh, 
uh, solution on the field, but you know, technology is still young, as I mentioned, when we are talking about uh, managing such an amount of edge devices. And then the other thing which was also important for us, it was like flexibility and scalability, right? Because we, we want to be able to, to manage uh, a lot of uh, uh, devices. And then nevertheless, one big, uh, one big point from, from my side is integration with the open source, right? Because uh, in this case, you know, you can easily try, you know, different things and then you can, you can decide which one is best for you. And then nevertheless, uh, you know, change is the only constant in the software environments, right? So then things are changing fast. You know, today we are using like a library. It can be that in six months there is a better one. So then try to avoid, you know, vendor locking, you know, just to avoid, uh, you know, going with the solution and then to be blocked and then to be all very difficult to, to try out something else. So that's why, you know, my recommendation is really to embrace the open source community. And then here on the right side, I just put like an image where we see Kubernetes in the middle. And then you, we can see that almost around all the challenges and, you know, key takeaways from, from us, there are a lot of, of libraries. So that's one of the reasons I also like uh, Palette when I, when I was doing the POC, because I had the freedom to try without actually requiring the, uh, without asking the Spectre team to do some custom implementation for that price Irona, I was able to try different uh, solutions here based on, based on whatever I was targeting. And then afterwards I was able to decide which, which is best for us. So that, yeah, that's pretty much uh, guys. So we will just go to the, to the last one. All right. Um, while you think of any questions, if you may have them, um, if you're interested or if you're inspired by this talk and you're interested in uh, joining Dentistry Serona in um, making the digital dentistry happen, the middle QR code brings you to the Dentistry Serona careers page, uh, where you can find open roles in uh, in their organization. If you want to find more resources about this particular talk, the QR code on the right brings you to a landing page on the SpectroCloud website, which will have this slide deck, a link to the video as soon as the CNCF releases it, and more resources about this talk. And with that, I'm opening it up for questions. Go ahead. So you have simple hardware device at the dental practice. How do you, how do you handle failures if you have a failure in the hardware? Do you have a second one you should have to be on standby? Yeah, so I mean, so for example, if there are really hardware failures, I mean, I think the only solution will be actually just to replace, uh, you know, the device itself. I mean, so yeah. right now they're on a single node solution. So in case of a failure, they just ship another one because they 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 do like uh, push out copies of the the patient data to uh, uh, safekeeping in the cloud, which means that at some point the device is replaceable. But they are looking at in the future going to multi-node strategy, where they could have like two or three nodes running there, so that if they have a physical hardware failure, then the other nodes can take over. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, on our side, we have some use cases, like, for example, a dentist, you know, I don't know, is scanning maybe, I don't know, three, four times a day. So then it doesn't make sense, for example, to, to bring to edge devices for this case. So we definitely have one node cluster, but then uh, obviously we have also some use case, like with big hospitals, where we will definitely go with multi nodes clusters. Hi, two questions. Uh, you mentioned proxies very shortly as one of the problems, but never touched on the solutions. Is this just covered by Pellet as well, or did you have to do something for that? Yeah, so I mean, whenever I mention about proxies, you know, just imagine that, for example, you just go in some uh, practice where actually in order to be able to reach internet, which is definitely necessary for us, you need to make some uh, configuration of the proxy, you know, which will be provided to us by the IT department of that practice, right? So we need to make the to make sure that we can cope with with this one because as soon as we will turn on the edge device, there is no connectivity. So that's why I mentioned in the onboarding sli slide that we have like this uh, onboarding application running on mobile, which talks with the device via the Bluetooth. 
So then we will be able from this device to push uh, network settings to the to the edge device. For example, one thing is you have to create a, to adjust the the proxy. Yeah. Okay. So out of the box, we use Cloud Init. You can add in additional configuration to push proxy at device flash time or at device boot up time. Uh, but in their case, uh, they wanted to be able for a field engineer at like initial implementation time to do it via via an app. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Second question, um, you mentioned that the usual case you onboard via a QR code they scan and that directs them to a website. Have you ever run into issues with uh, corporate policies that they couldn't like, log in on the phone and um, that leads to a weird dance of getting that redirection to a laptop where they actually have their credentials? Actually, what we're seeing is that while the QR code approach is really nice for a demo, all of our real customers, they use other options. So they either use something like Terraform to pre-provision these devices so that as they power up, they can immediately, immediately register. And since we've added auto registration somewhere last year, most customers really like that option because then they can just power it on and it will automatically register into their pallet tenant and then they can decide from there what happens with it. Okay, cool, thank you. Go ahead. What did you choose sure. for the Edge hardware? So is it standard hardware available that you just buy or is it something special created for you? No, actually it's nothing special. You know, we have some spe specification, but it's nothing more than some commercial, you know, products which are put together as an Edge device for yeah, us. Yeah, it's regular x86 yeah. hardware. So I guess I have two questions. So has you rolled this out, have you run, yet run into issues where, uh, um, where, where you, there's some CVE or something against the BIOS or some other firmware that you need to go update out in the field as well? Or is this something that you've seen yet? So the way that, this, uh, that we approach is because this is an, in, an immutable OS, there is some reduction in attack surface because they cannot make permanent changes to the device. Of course, that doesn't solve everything, but it does help in mitigating how powerful the attack vector can be. What then is the case that if, if it's a kernel issue um, with Ubuntu Pro, which Densely is, is oh, no, using, well, not kernel, they can do live the BIOS, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and if it's a CVE in a regular package, then um, what they do is they will, they will run a fresh build that gets the newer version of the packages and builds a new image. They upload that to their container repository and then through Palet, they can schedule an update to the newer image, which will download the fresh image, reboot into it, and then the cluster mm -hmm. runs with the CVEs fixed. Yeah, so that, doesn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't address if the UEFI BIOS has an issue, right? You're just talking about the Linux OS, which is important, right? But that right. So question. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, UEFI patching is not currently part of the solution. So um, the pre-staging step is most important here to make sure that everything is at the latest available versions. Uh, but um, it will probably be um, more part of uh, device lifecycle management, where uh, where these kind of things uh, are taken into okay. consideration. So second question. So we've seen this one. We had customers deploy it at the edge, they might have applications built for the cloud, like containers, and, but those might assume that they have uninterruptible power, and then they go run them on a the device out at the edge, and I would assume that the dentist is going to power off everything at the end of the day, right? They and do. So sort of like there's a challenge at the application level to know, are these, these, these containers that end up being deployed robust enough? And I don't know if this is something that you guys have seen and if you've sort of managed to, to test for this stuff, because I don't really know how to do this looking at all of the containers that are available out there. So. Yeah, so to, to, be, to be honest with you, so for example, as we are just shipping like an edge device without any keyboard and e even without any monitor, you know, the, the, the easiest way whenever, you know, they restart is just to have like a hard restart. So then, for example, sometimes we also have like, uh, we actually had some issues, for example, we, I mean, we are using uh, Longhorn as a, as a storage, and then we, we had several issues, you know, with this hard reset approach, because actually, for example, you know, uh, they were not able to recover after, uh, after restart. But then lately, I mean, the, the Rancher team, they actually improved this one. So then we have some workarounds, you know, for example, <laughs> in place, but 
I see actually that now this one, it looks way better. And the other, I mean, with pods, we didn't have many problems. But then the other issue we had also with this kind of uh, ninja restart approach was related to the databases, with the Postgres database we are running on the HD device. Because as soon as it was uh, uh, hardly set, uh, next time, for example, when, when the, the database started, it has to really recover and do a lot of uh, things. So it was actually taking quite some time to, to come back to a proper state. Uh, I understood that Palette was uh, relying on Cluster API. Is it something that you are using uh, in this uh, So pal Palet, the core platform, uses Cluster API for everything except Edge, because there's basically no Cluster API solution for Edge. So Edge is based on Kairos OS plus a bunch of our own technology, where we mimic a lot of the capabilities of Cluster API uh, for an edge specific solution. So what we do is for other, all other platforms like public clouds and on-prem VMware and bare metal with canonical mass, we use cluster API to build the cluster. And then our cluster agents take over to install all the other components. So you hear like all of the different software projects that Bogdan wanted to experiment with that is part of our cluster profile and our agents allow you to do that. For an edge device, that like, additional part is the same. So our, edge, uh, our uh, cluster management agent is able to do all of those additional components. But the building of the cluster itself, OS, Kubernetes, CNI, CSI, that is handled through a proprietary solution that is built on top of Kairos. All right, thank you all for showing up in such uh, huge numbers and uh, have a good trip back. Thanks, guys. <laughs> have a good trip.